So I've described the single cycle CPU at a relatively high level. Now let's start diving into more details. Let's first ask ourselves a question about you know which units need a clock, right? So what role does the clock play in this in the circuit? So we've seen that the program counter definitely needs a clock. At every rising clock edge, it records what the value of the PC should be for the next entire cycle. This value feeds us input to the instruction memory unit, and the instruction memory unit doesn't really need a clock. Once you provide the, the address as input, a few picoseconds later, the instruction spills out of this instruction memory unit, right? And so it's got a stable input for an entire cycle, and so it does not need any additional clock to coordinate its operations. Register reads also similarly don't need a clock. Once you provide an input to it, say register S0 and S and say T3, the values sitting at those register locations come out as outputs a few picoseconds later. So reading from the register file does not really need a clock. The ALU similarly does not need a clock, right? So we've seen before that the ALU or you know add units these are combinational circuits and don't really need a clock to coordinate their operations. Once you provide an input, a few picoseconds later, a valid output is produced. Now the data memory unit, just like the instruction memory unit, doesn't really need a clock to perform a read. Right? Once you give it valid inputs over here, a value gets read out of the data memory unit and a valid output shows up here a few picoseconds later. Okay, now the thing is the data memory unit as well as the instruction memory unit are fairly large structures. Okay, once you give it an address as input, there's a lot of stuff that, that is happening. It's very inefficient for those inputs to be unstable over the course of a cycle. Okay, so it's best to always proceed an instruction memory or a data memory unit with some kind of latch structure. Okay, so thankfully for the instruction memory unit, we already have a latch that is sitting right before it, which ensures that I'm going to give you a stable input. That input's not going to change for an entire cycle. You don't have to do you know, multiple operations in a cycle. And then at the next cycle, I may give you a new input, and then you start all over again. So it would be nice to have a similar semantics for the data memory unit as well. So what I'm going to do is add a latch over here, which gets updated only at periodic intervals and it ensures that the data memory unit has a stable input. Okay, now, unfortunately, I'm trying to do this entire instruction in one cycle. Okay, so a stable input is gonna show up to this latch somewhere in between that entire cycle. Okay, so I'm going to design this data memory unit and I'm gonna design this latch so that it records a new input at every falling edge. Okay, so at the rising clock edge, the PC gets updated then you go through all of these circuits and hopefully you can finish all of them in a half cycle. And then at the rising at, or at the falling clock edge, whatever is, has come out of this ALU gets recorded in this latch over here. Okay, so at this point, the data memory address input is being produced and is being latched. That serves as a stable input to this data memory unit for the rest of the cycle. So for this entire half cycle, the data memory unit has the stable input. It goes ahead and reads whatever value it has to read and produces a result over here, which then loops back, comes to the input to the register file. And so at this rising clock edge, the PC gets updated and the register write is performed. Okay, so I'm going to simplify the design of my circuits by having a latch before the instruction memory unit, which is a program counter, and a latch before the data memory unit. The register file, as I just described over here, also has a clock as input, and this is used while performing the write into the register file. Okay, so there are really three units over here that have clocks. There is this latch over here that is input to the instruction memory. There is this latch over here, which is input to the data memory unit. And then the register file itself is nothing but a set of latches. And so you can write into the, those latches only at every rising clock edge. So at the rising clock edge, you record whatever value was produced by the previous instruction. Now I'm just going to quickly go through these instructions again. This is an overview I went through in the last video as well, but it doesn't hurt to recap this because this is an important concept and this is a lot that I'm throwing at you in these videos. So in this slide over here, I'm just basically showing you how to implement R type instructions, which are of this form over here, where you have three register operands, you know, two as source, one as destination. 
So if you look at the register file, it has these three inputs, these three fiber inputs that tell me which registers I'm dealing with. So two of them are read registers. Accordingly, values get produced at these output ports over here. And then the third input over here is the write register. And there is also a write data input that tells me what value I'm writing into that register. There's also this blue symbol over here, which tells me that this is a control signal. It tells me if this instruction is producing a result that has to be written into the register file. Accordingly, reg write will be set to one. If it's set to zero, then this register file is not going to perform any any write in this cycle. That means it could be a store instruction or it could be a jump instruction that's not producing a new register value. Then if you look at the ALU, you'll see that it has inputs coming in over here. We said earlier that this input always comes from the register file. And this input over here could come either from the reg register file or it could come from the immediate field in the instruction. Then I have this other control signal that tells me what kind of ALU operation it is, right? So previously we had seen that you have uh, AI, BN, and then the op fields, which were provided as inputs to our 32-bit ALU. So similarly, I have an input coming here that tells me if I'm trying to do an add or a NOR operation and so on. Now let's look at the loads and the stores, right? So these are instructions of this form over here. Again, you have one read register input, in this case, register T2. For stores, you have two register read inputs, you know, T1 and T2 have to both be read out. So accordingly, either one output shows up here or two outputs show up over here. For a load instruction, I'm also going to be writing something into the register file. So T1 would be an input over here for this example. And the data that gets written into that register comes into this input here. The ALU in this case, what does it do? In this case, it performs the operation T2 plus 8. Because you're trying to compute the address at that point, that value feeds this input to the address of the data memory unit. And the value that I'm writing in, so if it's a store instruction, T1 is one of the operands over here. right? And so that value comes out over here, goes into this input here. And so the value in register T1 gets written into the address T2 plus 8. Okay, so that's how a load in the store goes through these different units. Then with the J type instructions, right now, you know, previously I just showed you how a jump operation works. Now let's look at an instruction like this, where I'm comparing T1 and T2. And if the two values are equal, then I'm going to jump to a location that is offset bytes away from my current location. Okay, so the two input values T1 and T2 show up here. I read those values out. Those get sent to the ALU. I'm going to perform a subtraction. And then if the zero bit is set, then it means that the two values were equal. So this then goes to the branch control logic that decides that whatever comes out from this adder is going to be the new value of the PC. Okay, so how is that computed? So firstly, I've gone through an add unit that does PC plus four for me. That shows up as input to this add unit here. To PC plus four, I'm trying to add the value of the offset. Okay, now, the offset is a 16-bit value. This is a 32-bit adder. So I need to sign extend my 16-bit value. So I'm basically taking the most significant bit and repeating it all the way for 32 bits. So that's what this unit does over here. Converts a 16-bit signed value into a 32-bit signed value. Having done that, I'm going to shift left by 2 because every instruction is a multiple of 4. Okay, so to save on bits, I don't store those redundant two zeros at the very end in my offset field over here. So I essentially have to add you know, two zeros to the right of, of my offset field. That makes it a multiple of four, and then I'm going to add it to PC plus four. Right? So that's what is being done here. Then I add it to PC plus four. That produces my branch target. That then loops back over here to my program counter register. Okay, so that's how a branch on equal to instruction is implemented. So now that we've seen all of these details, I'm kind of introducing those control signals here. So you'll see that the register write signal shows up here. There's a multiplexer before the ALU telling me that sometimes the second input of the ALU comes from the register file, and sometimes it comes from the immediate field in the instruction. Right? So that's the immediate field showing up here. 
That's the register input showing up here. And I have to make a decision about what kind of instruction this is. So this multiplexer is going to have a control signal that tells me, is this an R type instruction or an I type instruction or, or something else? Then similarly over here in the data memory unit, you have signals that tell me if I'm trying to do a read or a write. There's a multiplexer over here that tells me what should go back to the register file. Is it whatever value I read from memory or is it the result of the ALU if this is say an add instruction, right? So accordingly, one of those inputs or one of those outputs, either the output from the ALU or the output from the data memory is going to get routed back to the right input for the register file. And similarly up over here, there's a multiplexer that decides whether this is an instruction that's moving on to the next sequential operation or if it's jumping to some other instruction. Okay, so you know, you'll see that you can add more and more control signals. All of these control signals themselves are determined by looking at what kind of instruction this is, right? So you've produced a 32-bit instruction here. Accordingly, you analyze the bits in that instruction and you decide if this needs to write to the register file, if this needs to read or write from the data memory, how do I update my PC, what kind of inputs do I provide to, I, to my ALU, what kinds of inputs do I provide to the MUX before the ALU, and so on. It's this analysis of the instruction format that governs many of these control signals.